Hey, greetings and salutations to everyone. I am Aaron Dominguez speaking to you from Cancun, Mexico. Uh, today, the theme of this message is names. And the question I'm asking immediately is, are there sacred names in the Holy Bible? Uh, growing up in the Church of God, I heard many expressions and phrases that I took for granted as common. As I grew and God eventually called me under the tutelage of my parents, Tony and Sharon, I saw trends that had always existed, but I perceived them more clearly. And since I was baptized, along with my older brother, Derek, on the same day, December 20th, 1997, uh, at the home of Homer and Anna, Anna Moore, I am learning more on this subject all the time. This message is more of a Bible study than an actual sermon, and more of the topical overview than linguistic analysis of Biblical Hebrew or Koine Greek. The definition of sacred, connected with God or dedicated to a religious purpose and so deserving veneration, holy, hallowed, blessed, consecrated, dedicated, sanctified, or to bless. I guess that answers that. Turn off the lights and go home because the rest of my time I'm going to be wasting yours elaborating on what is clearly true. The answer by definition is yes. But as humans and for those associated to God's church, meaning anyone with God's Holy Spirit inside of them or God guiding them to becoming converted and baptized, thus following Jesus' example with John the Baptizer, to be baptized in the name of God the Father, Jesus Christ, and their power, which is the Holy Spirit. After receiving God's Holy Spirit, we are a part of the spiritual body of Christ. He is the head, and everyone else is a part of his body. A Christian, through prayer, studying, and fasting, seeks to discover God's given abilities to them that they have in honoring and glorifying God, not themselves. Perhaps this will be a review if you've heard this before, or maybe this is the first time. Either way, I'm going to explain the slide. The names of the five books of Moses are named by insipids. An insipid of a text is the first few words of the scroll or book employed as an identifying label, meaning the first few words beginning each scroll is incorporated as its title. In Genesis, the Hebrew word is Bereshit. It is literally the first word of the Bible, and it is translated throughout Genesis as first, beginning, choices, first fruits, even though it is not the word we find later in Exodus as first fruits. Bechor, okay? So, the highlighted letter is bet in Hebrew. That's the letter bet, B in English. It means in the, for the context, in the beginning, Bereshit, okay? So, in Exodus, you have names is what it means, and it's called Shemot in Hebrew. Shemot means names. We call it Exodus in English. Shem, the name of the son of the patriarch Noah, is the singular form for Shemot. Shem, Shemot. It's just a purification. Leviticus in Hebrew is Vayikra. Vayikra. The Kra or the Yikra is literally to call. So, and he called, meaning God called to Moses, which is the beginning of the first few letters of the scroll of Leviticus. So, if you look at the screen, in orange, highlighted is the letter Vav. Vav will be mentioned later on in this message, but the point that I'm making is it is and. It means and called. That is God calling to Moses or anyone, but it's just the word and the book Numbers. Numbers in English is Be Midbar, because Midbar means wilderness or deserted place. But in the letter Bet, if you look up and you see in Bereshit, it means in the. So in the wilderness, which is what God is speaking to Moses, and that is how it is called the title, 
Ben Midbar in the wilderness. Now, Deuteronomy is Devarim, Devarim in Hebrew, which means words, as in plural. Deber is singular for word. Devarim, words. That is what Deuteronomy is in Hebrew. And I'm certain you know this, but please permit me to remind you that Hebrew is written and read from right to left. Names is the topic. So what name is most important is God, obviously, God's name. Please turn with me to Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. That's Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. If you don't have a Bible, obviously, you could follow along in the slide. Uh, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Eheye Asher Eheye. And he said, that's God, thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Okay, is that clear, everyone? Um, remember that Moses is the author of the first five books. Five in Hebrew is Hamish. So the academic Jewish expression is Chumashim, for what is called for us. Also, reading the Bible and studying the Bible is the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch. Eheye, Asher, Eheye. I'm going to explain what it means and then unpack each of the words of the three words, even though the first and the last are exactly the same. Permit me to repeat that for the effect that I wanted to have. The first and the last are the same word. Okay? So if you recall, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, if your Bibles are still open, Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. I will be with you. That is Eheye. And it's just to a verse before. I will be. That is Eheye. God says this to Moses. I will be with you. The Strong's number for Eheye is 1961. And this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt... All of you will worship God on this mountain. This is in Arabia, not on the peninsula. This is in Arabia, Midian, where Jethro went, where the descendants, well, actually the son of Abraham, his name was Midian. So in Exodus 3, verse 13, God said to Moses, I am that I am. I will be that I will be. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am or I will be has sent me to you. Exodus 3 verse 5. Those of you who have Bibles, please look at Exodus 3 verse 5. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place that, that you are standing on is holy ground. That word is Strong's number 834. It is Asher. So if you look at the slide again, Eheye, I will be with you for the place that you stand. That is Asher and Eheye, I will be with you. I will be that I will be. Within the same chapter, God is explaining the words that he's using. Obviously, it's a lot more deep and profound for us to research, but that is what we were going to do. So keep it clear in your mind that God reveals his truth in his book, the Holy Bible. Never accept that we cannot prove who the eternal God is by his word. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is eternal life. All that we need to understand scholastically who our God is, is found in the pages of his book. Now, loving God and having an intimate relationship with him is a lifelong process of appreciation for his mercy, forgiveness, and compassion. 
And we who cannot see God, but we can see our neighbor, must be loving, forgiving, merciful, and compassionate to him or her. Whatever measure we use towards others, our Heavenly Father will be as merciful or harsh when judging us. And you know that you have love for another because I have loved you. We know this. We read this every pass over. Let's look at the tenses, the future, the past, and the present, okay? Ehie is the future of the same verb. Remember, future will be, present, I am, and past, I was. Ehie, the letters are Aleph, He, Yud, and He. Hova in the green, Hova in the green is in the present. The letters are in Hebrew, He, Vav, and He. In the yellow is Haya, Haya, which is the past. Conjugation, the letters are He, Yud, and He. Now in the, far, in the right corner, in the black and white, you will see the actual name of God. That is what he said, I will be known as, and we'll get to that in a moment, but in the church of God, it is our habit to not pronounce the name of God as other religious groups do in their tradition, whether it's Yehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yehoshua, Jehovah. We look at our English translations and have substituted the name eternal. Well, if you did not know before as to the specific reason why we in the, in the uh, churches of God had pronounced this tetragrammaton, the four letters on the bottom right, in black and white, if you did not know why we pronounced it as eternal, well, I'm about to remind those of you who know this and to show those of you who do not. Look in Google for the name of the God of Moses or the God of Israel or the God of the Jews, or of the Israelites, and you will see the Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton, which is the Yud, He, Vav, He, in black and white. In Hebrew, vowel points, and if you look in the slide, vowel points are seen in red. In red. Now, they were added a thousand years after the time of the apostles to help Jews to pronounce the names of words because there are repetitive words throughout the Hebrew and Aramaic portions of Scripture. Now, not that many heteronyms exist, like in English. So, a heteronym is produce and produce. Produce and produce, spelled exactly the same in English, but has a slight variation in pronunciation and clearly in meaning. One example in Hebrew of a heteronym is first fruits and firstborn. Bechor is firstborn. Bechor is first fruits. They are spelled exactly the same, but they have a different vowel conjugation, which is the red that you see in this slide. But because they are pronounced differently, they are used in different contexts of scripture, but it's exactly spelled the same. My point is, is that the simplicity of biblical Hebrew is to show that the tetragrammaton, black and white uh, name, yud he vav he, has a unique use for us as students of the Bible. Remember, we are researching names written in the Bible and trying to understand what God meant by their inclusion in the original language. Now, here is the Tetragrammaton in black and white, known by the letters yud he and vav he The translation we use in the Church of God is eternal. That's why I put the equal sign there. Why do we refer to the Lord of the Hebrew writings this way? Well, you can see in the slide the light blue. In the light blue, our God is in the future. The future. Green, our God is in the present. And yellow, 
our God was with our spiritual brethren in the past. Recall from the book of Hebrews, the so cloud of witnesses. That's them. God was with them. So, Eheye, light blue. Hova, green. Haya, in the yellow. All right. The future, the present, and the past. So, what word encapsulates that best in English? I would agree. He is eternal. In Exodus 3.15, right after introducing himself to Moses as I am or I am the future, God in the very next verse clarifies for Moses and for us what he means to everyone whom he chooses to have a relationship with. If you have a Bible, please turn to Exodus 3. Exodus 3 verse 16. God also told Moses, say to the Israelites, the eternal, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Now, remember, Moses is recording this in Hebrew for us to translate and read today in whatever language is your preference. The word God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that God himself tells Moses, and he writes it three times, is Elohe, Elohe. We will touch upon El in the relation to God later in this presentation. God, in his plan of salvation, chose through the promised seed of Seth, if we're going to go back that far, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, also through Noah and his son Shem. The promise was of the Messiah given to Eve all the way back into the Garden of Eden. The fulfillment of that promise was the prophesied birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we all know that the Father, God the Father, is the one who impregnated Mary. Now, the woman's seed, because women don't have seed, only men do, that would be God. But the lineage of Jesus Christ came through Judah, Yehuda in Hebrew. So in the city Jesus was born into, the name of the town, if you want to call it that, is Bethlehem. That was in Judah. Okay, now look closely at the letters of Yehua, the Tetragrammaton. Yud Hey Vav Hey. Now look closer at Judah's name in Hebrew. Yehuda. Yud Hey Vav Dalit Hey. Only one letter is the differentiation between the name of God Himself, the name that He would always be called, is what He said, from Judah. Isn't that interesting? Our God, the God of the Bible, declares the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. Some people will be quick to say Yehua is very similar to Yeshua, the anglicized name of Jesus in Hebrew. But we will cover that near the end of this discussion. I am not trying to start a movement to pronounce the Tetragrammaton in the Church of God. <laughs> Far from it. But as we see in the original languages, our God, the author of his book, has placed clues that we can see proof he is the God and there is none like him. Remember, every jot and every tittle. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by God Almighty, but by my name eternal was I not known to them. That's in Exodus 6, verse 3. Remember, Moses is the author, okay? Remember that. So Moses is writing this down for our benefit. When Moses writes the name, the Tetragrammaton, eternal in Hebrew, it is to be consistent from Genesis chapter 2 until the end of Moses' authorship, because he will die. Physically, he will die. But within the text, God reveals that this intimate name, the eternal, has been revealed to us, that as God who walked with Adam, with Abel, with Enoch, with Noah, with Shem, after the flood, we see a completely different world. Jethro, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, is familiar with the God of Abraham. However, 
so is Balaam. Now Jethro has another name, Reuel. Reuel, isn't that fascinating? Jacob's firstborn son, Reuben, Reuben, but it's Reuben, if you remember what Leah said, I see a son. To see God, El is God, that is Reuel. That is the other name for Jethro. That is incredible. Reuel or Jethro sees God's power. Astounding. Elohim. Genesis chapter 1, the word for God is Elohim, which is the plural form of El. The letters are FRL, Aleph, and Lamed. For Elohim, the plural, Aleph, Lamed, He, Yud, Mem. We can conclude two created all things in the recorded generic Hebrew name for powerful ones. Quite simple, but plain. Quote, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out wine and bread, since he is priest to God most high. The word God is El. If the Logos is there in person talking to Abraham, the word God most high is used correctly in the singular because it is a reference to God the Father before he revealed to us by his son, the Logos. Hebrews chapter 5, and no one takes upon himself the honor, but rather being called by God, just as Aaron also. So Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest, but the one having said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another place, you are a priest to the ages, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, having offered up both prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears, talking about Jesus Christ and Melchizedek, obviously the same breath, being able to save him from death and having been heard because of reverent submission. Though being a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those obeying him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The quotes from earlier, that's obviously from Hebrews 5, but the quotes in Hebrews 5 are from Psalm chapter 2 and Psalm 110. Okay, let's look closer at Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. But we're going to mostly focus on the Hebrew of the introduction of Melchizedek in English. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, since he is priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Notice in the yellow, king, Melech, is mentioned twice. Righteousness in green is mentioned uh, for he is the king of kings of righteousness. Peace. Shalom, but in this case, it is a place, so it's Salem, that is in the light blue. Bread, Lechem, is in the burgundy. Wine, Yayin, is in the red. Priest, Kohen, that is in the dark blue. You have God, El, in the purple. The middle blue color is El Elyon. Elion means most high. Now, imagine, in the yellow, the words king of righteous kings showing that Melchizedek is king of kings. What is, what is written in Revelation 19, verse 16? And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, king of kings and lord of lords. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, because the eternal your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great 
powerful and amazing God who does not show partiality. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, that the blessed and unique sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, will carry out in his own time. Going back to Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, they will war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And he will be accompanied by his called, the chosen and faithful. What is clear is Melech Kitzedek, the king of righteousness, is Christ Jesus of the Hebrew writings. He is in church speak, the God of the Old Testament. Permit me to read some of God's titles in the scriptures. Those of you willing to take notes, this will be extensive. Genesis chapter 15, verses 2 and 8. Genesis chapter 15, verses 2 and 8. Adonai Yahuwah, the eternal is Lord or sovereign or master. So Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I shall inherit it? Genesis 22, verse 14. Genesis 22, verse 14. Yahuwah Yireh, the eternal seas. Genesis chapter 22, 14. And Abraham called the name of the place the eternal seas, as it is said to this day on the mount of the eternal shall he see. In your version, in your translations, it might be provided. The word is yire. You can look up in Strong's. It means to see. So as you noticed, when God told Abraham to look up at the stars and see their number, this is the same word. It is a synonym for awesomeness. However, in this place, in this scripture, Genesis chapter 2, 2 to 22, think about Mount Moriah, where God told Abraham to take his son, his only son that is beloved to him, both to Abraham and to God, that that is the exact same location 2,000 years later that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, will be sacrificed. Let's continue with Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. Also in Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Yehua Nisi, the eternal is our banner. This name is for us to reflect God wherever we go. In the new covenant, we put on God's armor every day to contend with God the adversary. In Exodus 17, verse 15, then Moses built an altar and called its name, the eternal is my standard. Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, this is a reference later on that Jesus makes. In John, then the eternal said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and mount it on a pole, a nisa, a banner, when anyone who has been bitten looks at it, he shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and mounted it on the pole. If anyone bitten looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Yahuwah Rapha, the eternal, the healer. Those of us in health difficulties, we know God is our healer. But more importantly, he heals us spiritually. That is absolutely more important than our physical healing because we know we shall all be changed in the regeneration. So the quote of the scripture in Exodus 15, 26 is, or I am the Lord who heals you. Judges chapter six, verse 24. Judges chapter six, verse 24. Yehua Shalom. The eternal is peace. True peace always surrounds God. We are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
In Judges 6.24, then Gideon built an altar to the eternal and called him the eternal is peace. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. And chapter Jeremiah 33, verse 16. Jeremiah 33, verse 16. The eternal our righteousness. Yahuwah Fedikenu. Yahuwah Fedikenu. He is our breastplate that protects us from our adversaries. It is not our righteousness. It is his righteousness we put on. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. Judah will be saved in his days and Israel will live sure. And this is his name by which he will be called the eternal our righteousness. Jeremiah 33, verse 16. Jeremiah 33, verse 16. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live safely. And this is the name with, with which it will be called the eternal our righteousness. In Exodus 31 verse 13. Exodus 31 verse 13. Also in Leviticus chapter 20 verse 8. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 8. Yehua Merekishkim. Mehuda Kerekishkim. The eternal sanctifies us and he sanctifies us by the knowledge of truth, his truth. And the natural consequence is we draw closer by obedience through faith to him. So in Exodus 31 verse 13, quoting the scripture, tell the Israelites, you shall keep my Sabbaths. This will be a signal, a sign, a mark between me and you for the coming generations so that you know that I am the eternal who sanctifies you. Leviticus 20 verse 8, and you will keep my statutes and put them into practice. I am the eternal one who sanctifies you. Psalm chapter 7 verse 17. Psalm chapter 7 verse 17 and Psalm 47 verse 2. Psalm 47 verse 2. Yahuwah Eleon, eternal most high. We just read this quote. We just saw this earlier with Abram. From the creation accounts, he is superior to all, all, and even our adversary, who desired, desired to ascend above the, all the stars to be like him. Psalm 23, Yahuwah Roi, the eternal is my shepherd. One of the most famous psalms that anybody in or outside of a church can recite. We who have God's spirit hear his voice and he is gentle to correct his sheep. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The eternal is my shepherd and I shall not fail. Psalm 95, Psalm 95, verses 3 through 7. Yahuwah Oseinu. Yahuwah Osenu, our eternal is creator. Psalm 95, verse 6. He created us, therefore he owns us in everything ever in existence, because the eternal is a great God, a great king over all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and to him belong the summits of the mountains. His is the sea, because he did it and his hands form the dry land. Come and worship and prostrate yourselves, ourselves. Let's kneel before the eternal, our creator, because he is our God, and we are the people of his meadow, the sheep under his care. Genesis chapter 32, verse 29. Genesis chapter 32, verse 29, and chapter 48, verse 6. Genesis chapter 48, verse 6. Yahuwah Sabot the eternal of hosts. The word sabot is first seen when the angel of the eternal is talking to Joshua right after he crossed over the Jordan. It is the armies of the eternal 
whom Hannah, the mother of Samuel, spoke first when praying to God in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And God answered her prayers. After she uses this word to describe our God, it is seen another 283 times. Wow. So in Genesis 32, verse 29, Genesis 32, verse 29, then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. Genesis 48, verse 16, Genesis 48, verse 16, the messenger, Hamelech, who has delivered me from every evil will bless the boys and my name will be called in them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac they shall grow and they shall multiply within the earth So what was the actual name of Jesus? To help us answer this question, I've enlisted the help of Dr. Benjamin Suchard, a historical linguist with a specialization in Biblical Hebrew. So he'll pop in from time to time. Let's start with the source material, the New Testament. See, the books of the New Testament were composed in Koine Greek, which was widely spoken in the Eastern Mediterranean world in the centuries after Alexander the Great. Since the Gospel writers and the Apostle Paul were writing in Greek, they wrote the name of Jesus like this. Jesus, which, as we'll see later, is the name that was eventually transliterated into English. But Jesus wasn't Greek, and his name wasn't a Greek name. He was a Galilean Jewish man living in a predominantly Aramaic-speaking region, a Semitic language closely related to Hebrew. So Jesus is a transliteration of a transliteration of a Hebrew and Aramaic name, specifically a name for Joshua. So how does that work? Well, in the Hebrew Bible, there are two prominent characters named Joshua. First, we have Joshua, son of Nun, the Israelite military commander and right-hand man to Moses, who, according to the Bible's version of history, led the Israelite conquest of the land of Canaan. Then there's a less famous Joshua the high priest, who appears in some of the latest books in the Hebrew Bible as the first high priest after the people of Judah returned home from the Babylonian exile. Even though we use the same English name Joshua to refer to these two guys, in Hebrew Bible manuscripts, there are two versions of this name. The older version for Joshua is Yehoshua, which is most often used for Joshua the son of Nun. But there's another shorter variation of this name generally used for Joshua the high priest, Yeshua. Think of it like the name James becoming the name Jim. It's not really a nickname, but rather a shorter, more colloquial version. Yeshua was the more common form of this name in late biblical Hebrew. For example, Joshua son of Nun is called Yehoshua in the older book of Joshua, but in the much later book of Nehemiah, he's called Yeshua. So the name was interchangeable depending on if you're using the earlier or later form. But it's this shorter, later variation that became popular in Aramaic during the Second Temple period. If you wanted to name your kid Joshua in the centuries after the Babylonian exile, you'd name him Yeshua. So case closed, right? Jesus was living during the Second Temple period when Aramaic became the day-to-day -day language for Jews living in the Galilee. So his Aramaic name must have sounded something like Yeshua. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. And the complication comes from that final syllable, the a uh, part of Yeshua. For those of you Hebrew Bible and Aramaic experts in the audience, you know I've been playing a bit fast and loose with that pronunciation. Yeshua is spelled with four letters in Hebrew and Aramaic, Yod, Shin, Vav, and Ein, read from right to left and without vowels. That final letter Ein is not actually an equivalent to the English vowel A, but rather it's what's called a guttural letter, one of several in the Hebrew and Aramaic alphabet. Ein is created in the back of your throat. This affected the pronunciation of the name. But we know from especially from Greek transcriptions, that this little ah uh, you hear at the end before the ein sound, the ah uh in Yehoshua and the ah uh in Yeshua, that wasn't originally there. If you go all the way back in time, the, the names would have been pronounced as something like Yehoshua and Yeshua without an ah uh there. Thus, the name probably sounded less like Yeshua, with that prominent final syllable rhyming with words like kama or lama or iguana, but closer to what Dr. Suchard is doing. Yeshua. Constricting the upper portion of the throat to produce what's called a pharyngeal consonant. You might be thinking, that's close enough. Many languages like English do not have an equivalent sound, and that ein sounds close enough for most people to justify the pronunciation Yeshua.
And this eventually did become the proper pronunciation of this name. Remember I said that these two names for Joshua appear in the Hebrew Bible, specifically in Hebrew Bible manuscripts. Throughout late antiquity and into the medieval period, hundreds of years after Jesus, Jewish scribes called the Masoretes started adding vowel markers, alerting readers what vowels they should use to correctly pronounce the words in the Hebrew Bible. One of these vowel markers is called a furtive patach, also known as the sneaky A. It's a little line added below a guttural letter if that letter appears at the end of a word, because in Biblical Hebrew, guttural letters prefer an A vowel before them. To summarize, that A sound in the final syllable was a later invention to help ease readers into pronouncing the final ein. As the scholar of Hebrew Richard Steiner says, the furtive patach must have originated as a short, barely audible transitional vowel before final consonants, but eventually became so regular and so prominent that it came to be perceived as a separate syllable. Thus, Yeshua is correct if we're following the Masoretic text. But as Dr. Suchard said, this sneaky A did not exist during the time of Jesus. The name Yeshua just ended with a guttural ein. This might seem like a minor quibble, but it's actually very important for reasons that will become apparent in the final section of this video. So allowing for some level of imprecision and regional variation, it's this version. Yeshua. That was the dominant form of the name in Judea and the Galilee during the Second Temple period. In fact, according to an extensive study on Jewish names, this was the sixth most common male name for the period. The name appears in the Dead Sea Scrolls, even when referring to Joshua the son of Nun, and it's also found inscribed on bone boxes called ossuaries, which were used around the time of Jesus to contain the skeletal remains of the deceased. And here's where Greek re-enters the scene. In the centuries before Jesus, around the 3rd century BCE, people started translating the Hebrew Bible into Greek, eventually producing a Greek version called the Septuagint. What's interesting is the Greek translators decided to transliterate both Hebrew versions of the name Joshua as Jesus. Go pick up your copy of the Septuagint and you'll notice that the book of Joshua is called the book of Jesus. Ironically, the book of Jesus. This means they dropped Yehoshua entirely and transliterated Yeshua, basically following the dominant variation of the name during their own contemporary period. So how did we get from Yeshua to Jesus? To create the first syllable, the Septuagint translators used the Greek vowel iota to create the Y sound. Thus we get ie. But Greek doesn't have a sh sound, so they changed the letter sheen to the closest approximation, the Greek letter sigma. So we get ies. But Greek also doesn't have the ein, so they just dropped it entirely, leaving us with the name Yesu. The S was added to the end because that's a Greek grammar thing. It's how Greek renders what's called the nominative case, the grammatical case used for the subject of a sentence, giving us Jesus. This explains why the Gospel writers and Paul use the name Jesus in their own writings. As Greek speakers, they read the Septuagint Bible in their day-to-day -day life, and they constantly quote the Septuagint Bible in their own writings. So they already had an established way to write this name in Greek. And in fact, when Joshua the son of Nun is mentioned in the New Testament, he's also called Jesus. That made its way into Latin almost unchanged as Jesus. But you might notice, where's the J? Well, as Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade taught us, J is not in the Latin alphabet. J is actually the most recent addition to the English alphabet. It started its life as just a fancy way to draw the letter I, a flourish used at the end of a Roman numeral or to start a paragraph. But eventually this fancy I was adopted as a new letter to denote the J sound that entered the English language thanks to influence from Old French. And in fact, early modern English writers would write English J words with an I. Even as late as 1611, when the first edition of the King James Bible was published, I and J were not distinguished from one another. All J names in the Bible, including Judas, Jesus, and John, were all spelled with an I. It was not until 1629, with the first major revision of the King James Bible, that they were finally differentiated. Add some influence from Germanic languages, which makes the S between two vowels sound like a Z, and we finally arrive at Jesus. But let's complicate this even more. You might be wondering, why did the Greek translators transliterate this name as Jesus and not Yesuas? That guttural ein makes some sort of noise, enough of a noise that later scribes leading up to the Masoretic text started adding the sneaky A to help pronounce it. Which begs the question, when transliterating this name, did they drop the ein because they didn't know how to write it in Greek, or because they were not hearing it pronounced in the first place? Some academics have argued that the name of Jesus sounded more like Yeshu or Yeshu, 
completely dropping off the final guttural letter because of a linguistic quirk of a Galilean accent. As the argument goes, Galilean Aramaic speakers were supposedly very bad at pronouncing guttural letters. There is some evidence for this position, but it's not conclusive. The main body of evidence that academics cite comes from later Jewish texts. Jesus is mentioned in some rabbinic texts, and there the form of his name is Yeshu without an ayin at the end. So that's interesting because there's also mentions in other rabbinic texts saying that Galileans have a hard time pronouncing the a and the ha and, and things like that. One of these stories that Dr. Sushard is referencing comes from the Babylonian Talmud. The text says, a certain Galilean went around saying to them, who has Amar? Idiot Galilean, do you mean a donkey for riding, wine to drink, wool for clothes, a lamb to kill? Because if you were sloppy with your gutturals and your vowels, donkey, wine, wool, and lamb could all sound like Amar. Another passage implies that Jews from northern towns around the Galilee, like Haifa and Beit Shan, were not even allowed to read the Torah or recite particular prayers, because if they would mess up their eins, they could accidentally say something blasphemous. So are these Talmudic stories evidence that Galileans were dropping the ein and calling Jesus Yeshu? Some scholars say yes, others are not so convinced. In many respects, the Babylonian Talmud is not particularly strong evidence. It's true that the text contains a lot of older material that may shed light on daily life in earlier centuries, but it's a much later text, compiled in the 500 CE. So it might be more possible that these stories reflect the Galilean accent during the 500s, hundreds of years after the time of Jesus. Moreover, we should be skeptical because stories about Galilean being unrefined bumpkins should be taken as unflattering caricatures and not unbiased reflections of a regional speech pattern. Another tantalizing line of evidence comes from other Semitic languages related to ancient Aramaic, like Syriac and Mandaic, a form of Aramaic used as a liturgical language by the ethno-religious people group called the Mandaeans. In Mandaic, Jesus is called Ishu, and the ancient Christian writer Ephraim the Syrian mentions that some Syriac-speaking Christians were calling him Isu both of which lack an ein. Some have proposed that if these variations were passed down orally from an earlier form of Aramaic, they might preserve an ancient pronunciation of the name without an ein. But as is the case with the evidence from the Talmud, this is making a historical argument using data that post-dates the time of Jesus by hundreds of years. Evidence from closer to the time of Jesus is not conclusive. There are some indications that Aramaic-speaking Jews everywhere in the region, not just in the Galilee, were softening their gutturals. For example, the scribes of the Dead Sea Scrolls frequently drop the guttural letters out of Hebrew words when they appear in the middle of the word, but not so much when these letters appear at the end of a word. Ultimately, we don't know whether or not the ein was pronounced, but several recent studies on the subject say that the idea that Galileans were dropping their gutturals is overblown and relies way too much on those funny stories from the Talmud. Whether or not the name had a final ein, though, there's a strong possibility it had short vowels. In, in East Syriac, it's Isho with an E and an O. That looks like it comes from Yeshu with short vowels. So that's a bit surprising because the name Yeshu has two long vowels in Hebrew. And that's also why in Greek it gets written with a, an eta, a long a, right? Ye, and then sus, a long u. But we do know something about Galilean Aramaic from a few centuries later. When Galilee for a while was the center of, of uh, Judaism, after a, a revolt got the Jews kicked out of Judea, there's a study of that kind of Arama Aramaic, which has shown that they didn't have vowel length. They just had five vowels, a, a, e, o, u, and no, no length, no a, a, e, o, u anymore, which means that yeshu or yeshu would have been pronounced as yeshu or yesho. And that could have been borrowed into East Syriac. And I think that's a, a very cool idea that even though Syriac itself originally preserved a length distinction. They heard uh, people talking about this Galilean called Yeshur, so they borrowed it with short vowels, and that ends up as Isha. So to summarize, in later Hebrew Bible manuscripts, the name for Joshua and Jesus is Yeshua. During the time of Jesus, in Aramaic, the answer is somewhat more inconclusive, but we can arrive at close approximations depending on how we hypothesize what the Galilean accent sounded like, whether the name had long or short vowels, and whether or not they pronounced the final ein. I think it's likely that if you want to have a really strong Galilean accent and say Jesus, you're going to get 
Yeshu with two short vowels and no ein. The ein might have been present there because it does show up in Syriac. So Yeshu with a, a short vowels and an ein at the end there would probably also still be fairly recognizable. Though let's say you were a Galilean who wanted to speak a proper form of the name, then you'd say it with long vowels and a nice guttural ein. Yeshu. In this slide, you have three words written in Greek and their translation into English. Theos is God. Pater, Pater is Father. Kyrios is Lord. Let's begin with Theos, God. The Greeks revered both gods and goddesses. Their society was polytheistic, and they did not have any sacred texts, which is the definition we began this study with. Remember, sacred holy, hallowed, blessed, consecrated, dedicated, and sanctified. The Greeks did not have any of those texts, according to historians. The deities were myths, largely associated and representative of natural phenomena mixed with carnal human behavior. Paul, if you recall, revealed the unknown God to them. The God word he used is Theos. The God that we know is the God of gods, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. So Paul used in Acts the generic Greek word theos to begin teaching. And if you recall also, the pagans with Barnabas and Paul, they were mixed up so badly that they referred to them as Greek myth heroes. The next word, father or pater. Father is a male parent, also known as the head of the household, also the parent, also a forefather, and also an honorific title. The word recorded for our benefit is to grasp the family of God in the New Testament. It must begin with a father and has a son, and then children are adopted into the family, their family. Lord, Kyrios. In classical Athens, the word Kyrios referred to the head of the household who was responsible for his wife, his children, and any unmarried female relatives. It was res the responsibility of the Kyrios to arrange the marriages of his family relatives provide their dowries, represent them in court if necessary, and deal with any economic transactions. They were involved in the worth of more than a medimos of barley, which is 51 dry liters of measurement. When an Athenian woman married, her husband became her new curios, her new lord. So what does this all mean? Holy names in the Bible, original words of the books of Moses, names and titles found throughout the scriptures, understanding that languages change over time, but the written word of God does not. God's truth is the Bible and is for us to utilize for instruction in his righteousness, truth, wisdom, correction, and doctrine. It means that information exists in the Bible when we study it. We realize that we do not understand everything. Our God, the author, left clues to understand his character, but no human can fully understand the mind of God. We are not his equals, regardless of some of the more educated amongst us feeling that they are homo sapiens sapiens, wise, wise human beings. God is above and we are below. The Passover is approaching and we can reflect some Sabbath afternoon as to why our God used three languages to preserve his word. But put yourself in the sandals of any biblical human figure that you want to and they, like us, are saved by grace through faith in the Creator God. What I read in my Bible is when our Messiah returns in Revelation 3.12, 12, he will give us a stone with our new name. 
and he will write upon us his new name. But until that day, whatever language you communicate, the Great Commission and making disciples all over this planet, we still teach that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, brothers and sisters, I hope that this has been encouraging and that you can launch your own interesting studies further than where we visited today. Wherever you are, please have a peace-filled and spiritually enriching Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom, Kol Am Israel.